mission of the Institute. Um, we got off to a little bit of a rocky or antagonistic beginning. Uh, because my relationship with my parents was sort of arguments about why I had to do my homework, about what I was reading, why I had to read critically, about what I was seeing on screens. Um, but as often happens when we're working with young people and parenting young people, is the conversations that you have plant little seeds. And we're not quite sure where they're going to go and how they're going to blossom, how they're going to develop. And so what happened for me is as I got older and I started, hopefully I'm recording. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so what, what happened for me is as I got older, as I started looking at the world around me, as I started thinking about how I was learning, how I was building relationships, how I was thinking about who I was and who I wanted to be, I couldn't ignore the powerful role that screens were having in my life. So I sort of sheepishly head down and return to my dad um, in my early 20s and said, you know what, we actually have a lot in common. And let's join forces and do some work together. So our original work was really all centered around media, digital media, and its impact on brain development and youth development. We're not going to touch on those issues today. That was just a teaser. Um, perhaps that's another morning together. But since that time, our work has really broadened. Because what we found is that we couldn't really talk about the impact of media on youth development without understanding what's going on in this miracle perched on top of their shoulders, the brain. And once we started using brain development as an entry point for understanding media, it opened up a number of other topics. How can this incredible, all, all the incredible new discoveries in brain science help us better understand not just media's impact on young people, but how we can better serve them, how we can better work with them, and how we can better sort of leverage their strengths in all of our communities. So, um, Part of what we've been doing is based on this book called Why Do They Act That Way? A Survival Guide to the Adolescent Brain for You and Your Teen. This is written by my dad. Have any of you actually read this book? Oh, only one of you good? Okay, the rest of you I got to you first. I actually prefer to get to you before you read the book because if you ever read the book, you will find my adolescent temper tantrums, meltdowns <laughs> throughout every page. So 95% of the book is really great. The 5% that references me and my two older brothers, it's a pack of lies. <laughs> a word that it says, I actually was giving a workshop to young people about their brains a couple of weeks ago, and this young 14-year-old asked me to autograph next to one of my most <laughs> meltdowns in the book. So I never thought that's how I have fame and fortune. Um, but I'm glad I could be of a service to my dad as an author. So um, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to take a quick tour of some of the themes that we talk about in this book. Why do they act that way? A survival guide to the adolescent brain. So I want to get a sense, I know that all of you are working with adolescents, with youth workers. Um, how many of you are parenting teenagers in your home right now? Okay, a, a handful of you. Um, how many of you were teenagers at one point in your life? <laughs> oh, okay, only about half of you. So <laughs> actually went from 9 to 25 like this. So um, the reason, a little closer for them, that's good. So Chris, what's going on? I don't know. <laughs> um, the reason I asked the first question and the, how many of you are parenting teenagers is because there are a handful of you who are who have teens in your home right now. And I invite you to wear both of your hats and wear your supervisor hat and feel free to wear your parent hat as well. Um, the reason I ask the, the last question, how many of you were teenagers at one point in your life, is because we have a job to do together on this cold, snowy Minnesota morning, is that we have to overcome what I call adult amnesia, which is this tendency when you're in your late 20s and beyond to sort of put your hands on your hips, <sighs> take a deep sigh and say, oh, kids these days, I, do, I don't know what's going on. I was never like this <laughs> when I was 15 years old. And this is a powerful sort of cultural force around oh, kids these days. What they are, bad luck, every one of them. Um, and so we have to do a little bit of overcoming adult amnesia. So in that spirit, I'm not gonna, I promised you I wouldn't have you role play. I promised you I wouldn't have you come up here. I'm just going to ask you to turn to the person next to you in a moment after you do a quick thought exercise. What I want you to do, if you want to close your eyes, fine. If you just want to look ahead, no big deal. But I want you to take yourself back to that rocky, exhilarating journey from childhood to adulthood. I want you to think about your own adolescence. And I'm going to give you about a minute to think not about what you did, where you went to school, but about how it felt. What about the feelings that you had as a 14, 15, 16 year old? So I'm going to give you about
about a minute just to go back to that time in your life, and then I'm going to have you turn to somebody next to you to share a couple of those words. So, Exercise. We don't have much time. Some of you could have stayed in that space for a long time. Some of you got a look of panic and terror on your face. <laughs> I, 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 was, I got to be in the Toronto area a couple weeks ago with a bunch of, or before the holidays, with a bunch of youth workers, and I, I asked them to do this exercise, and this woman in front just put her head in her hands and just I was like, don't make me go back there. <laughs> um, so for some of you, those might have been fond memories, for some of you, not so much. So if you could just turn to the person next to you and just share some of the words, some of the feelings that you associate with that, that transition time between childhood and adulthood. Introduce yourselves if you don't know each other already. what's going on in their brains. 
No young person can be reduced to what's going on up here, but understanding what's going on in the brain can help us better understand why we tend to describe adolescence in the same way. When I ask young people, what's the difference between being seven and being 15? The word that tends to bubble to the top in bold is the word drama. And it can be great drama. I'm kidding now, we have one young person in the room, so we're gonna be fact checking all of this. <laughs> that things feel more dramatic in the best possible ways and in the most alienating, isolating ways. And sometimes in the course of an hour a day or a week. It's an incredible ride, at least in part explained by what's going on in their brains. So I wanted to ask, I wanted to take the time to do that because as people who work and supervise young people, it's important that we overcome that adult amnesia and remember not just that the young people you work with are 15 and there's where they go to school and here's what their interests are. But remember what it feels like to be 15 on the verge of adulthood. Because what we have to do is we have to overcome this problematic sentiment of kids these days. Here's a quote that I put up here because I don't agree with it, but I think it just sort of illustrates this kids these days mentality. Our youth now love luxury, they have bad manners contempt for authority, they show disrespect for their elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room, contradict their parents, they chatter before company, gobble up their food, and tyrannize their teachers. In other words, kids these days. Now, you might be surprised to learn that these are the words of Socrates in 5th century BC. So every generation of adults that tends to say, what's going on with this generation? Some of the most perplexing, challenging, and amazing parts of adolescence are true generation after generation after generation. And if we start telling this narrative, we're not going to set our youth workers up for success. So let's pick this apart. Why do these sentiments keep arising? Let's take a quick tour of the teenage brain. Now some of you have pens, some of you are writing. I, um, I'm trying to get better at telling people the beginning of presentations that I can send you the PowerPoint. I've given you all um, a little card. If you put your name in your email, I'll send you uh, this and a number of handouts. Um, I found that when I copy out handouts, or three or four of you are really excited, and the rest of them are in the recycling bin. Um, so if you're interested in this, I'll send it to you. I'm trying to get better at telling at the beginning, because it tends to be at the end when your hand is gnarled from writing. And I'm like, oh, by the way, I'll send you the notes. Um, that doesn't go well, so I'll send it to you. So let's take a tour of the brain to better understand what's going on during adolescence. You may under recognize this image on the screen here. It's the basic building block of the brain or the neuron. Um, our brain is essentially a vast electrical system. At any given time, your brain is generating enough electricity to light up a 25 watt light bulb. So electrical impulses enter the branches on one end of the brain cell or the neuron, called the dendrites, zip along the cable or the axon, exit the branches on the other end, jumping over a tiny gap, we call a synapse, and then connecting with the dendrites of another neuron, linking those brain cells together to create the incredibly complex mental map that students will carry on top of their shoulders for the rest of their lives. Now, the numbers are really quite astounding. <coughs> Babies are born into the world with 100 billion neurons at birth. Each one of those neurons has about 10,000 branches, so for the mathematically gifted among you, you've quietly calculated in your seats that this means that in the brain of a brand new baby, there are one quadrillion possible connections. So more than there are stars in the universe. Only 17% of these possible connections are actually wired into neural networks at birth. So in the days, weeks, months, and years, and what we're gonna talk about today, the decades that follow, those neurons are firing and wiring together to create that mental map kids will carry on their shoulders for the rest of their lives. Now, there used to be a big argument about what drove the wiring of the brain. And it was the old nature versus nurture argument. So are, are young people hardwired to act a certain way? Is it sort of predetermined how their brain is going to develop? Or is it the experiences that they have that shape the growth and development of the brain? Of course, that argument has largely been put to rest, and we agree now that it's really a both and. That there's some hardwiring, temperament matters, but that also the experiences that young people have have a great impact on how their brain grows and develops. 
So language is a great example of this. I have a two and a half year old son, and like most children, he was born into the world hardwired to make noise, lots and lots of noise. Now, which of the world's 6,500 spoken languages my son ends up speaking depends, of course, on the sounds he hears around him, the words, and everything that he hears in his family and in his community. So there's this constant interplay between genetics hardwiring and the soft wiring or experience. We're going to be focusing on the soft wiring today because this is where you play an incredibly powerful role as supervisors. You have the capacity to shape the experiences that young people have as their brain is growing and developing. Because not all experiences are created equal, but they all fall under this same sort of rubric. If you remember one thing about brain science, neuroscientists have come up with a way to help us better understand the role of experience in the growth and development of the brain. And that is this phrase called, the neurons that fire together, wire together. I like to think of that as whatever the brain does a lot of, is what the brain gets good at. Whether it's texting, whether it's hockey, whether it's imagination, whether it's respect, whether it's organization, our brains are use-dependent and practice-dependent. It requires repetition and exercise for those neurons to fire and wire together and gain some semblance of permanence. So experience matters because it shapes the practice and the exercise that the brain gets. But not all experiences are created equal. Some experiences have a far greater impact on the brain than others. The experiences that have the greatest impact on the brain are those that happen during what we call windows of opportunity and windows of sensitivity. Those windows of opportunity are growth spurts in the brain. The experiences that the brain has while it's growing and developing have a greater impact than at any other time in a young person's life. So this makes a lot of, this is an important thing to remember because you're working with young people, as we'll explore in a moment, during an incredible window of opportunity. What this means is we can think of all kinds of examples that might be intuitive to you. How many of you have ever seen a little one grow up in a bilingual household or go to a dual immersion in school, right? And they take to language seemingly effortlessly. My niece, Lucila, can speak Spanish and English without even, I've never seen her do flashcards or worksheets. I have been taking Spanish for 20 years. <laughs> and I can converse with family and friends, but as I will always be asked, where did you learn this language? Because I will never sound like a native speaker. Because the window of opportunity, the growth spurt, where language was, for language was wide open as in those early years. That doesn't mean we can't learn it later on, but the experiences that you have during those growth spurts have a greater impact than ever again. So this begs the question, what, what's going on with those growth spurts? We used to, this is, if we were in our room here and you all were early childhood educators, you'd all be nodding, yep, got it. This is, this, is bread, this is our bread and butter, right? Because we've known that the brain is like a sponge in early childhood for a long time. This is why we invest in resources for zero to five, this is why we make sure that we surround kids with positive experiences in those early years of life. But we used to think that those growth spurts were all done around the age of 12. And that is because without technology to look inside the brain, all we did was look at kids. We would look at a 12-year-old brain, and we would look at an adult brain, and they're about the same size. And we couldn't actually do anything else without killing kids, which is not a good idea for science. And so all we could do was really look at them and say, well, it's, a, it's about the same size as an adult brain, so it must be a finished product. Now, this doesn't mean that we didn't think you can't keep learning throughout your lifetime. But the lion's share of those critical growth spurt and those windows of opportunity we thought were closed. Just about the time that kids hit adolescence. Once we developed the technologies to scan the brains, fMRI machines, PET scans, all of a sudden, all of those old theories were blown completely out of the water, and a new picture emerged that looks a lot different from the old one. The pictures that you see on the screen here help us better understand the growth spurts in the brain. So for our purposes here today, you know, the green and yellow parts are the parts of the brain that are under construction, and the purple parts of the brain are the part that are more more fully wired. So we weren't surprised to see the difference between a five-year-old brain and a 20-year-old brain. We were very surprised to see that there's differences between eight and 12, 
12 and 16, and that there are still some core areas of the brain that are under construction <coughs> between 16 and 20, and now we know that the brain is not completely done with its wiring until about the age of 25. Some neuroscientists are going all the way up to 30, but let's stick with 25. Um, in terms of being done with all of those critical, sensitive windows of opportunity where the brain is growing and developing. What this means is that the brain is under construction from early childhood all the way through high school and even into young people's young adult lives. Now, this is interesting on its own, but not nearly as interesting as what we're going to dedicate the rest of our time to, which is where are those growth spurts and what does that mean for us? The major growth spurt, the major construction zone in the adolescent brain is the part of your head or the part of your brain right behind your forehead called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex plays an incredibly important role in our brain. I like to think of it as the brain's orchestra conductor. Some people talk about the prefrontal cortex as the brain's CEO, the executive producer of the brain. This is the part of our brain that manages competing impulses, that helps us engage in goal-directed behavior. It helps us manage our emotional impulses and move in the direction that when we're calm and secure that we know we want to go. So I don't know how many of you have taken psychology classes, but maybe you remember the story of a man named Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was, we're not going to go into the whole story, but he was one of the first people that helped us understand the role of the prefrontal cortex. Phineas Gage was a, he had worked on the railroad for a long time. Poor old Phineas had a railroad accident and actually had a tamping rod, a long steel pole, sort of shot through his head during um, an accident at the railroad. So you're thinking, why are we talking about Phineas and why are we telling the story that ends in death? What's amazing is that Phineas Gage didn't die, he didn't even lose consciousness. What happened is that Gage re recovered, but he was immediately let go from the railroad because Gage was no longer Gage. In your place of a friendly, courteous, thinking ahead, thoughtful, always coming on time, managing his projects effectively, was a Gage who said whatever he wanted to say whenever he wanted to say it, barely showed up for work on time, was surly to his friends, happy one minute, mean the next. Gage was no longer Gage. What was going on? We didn't understand until we discovered that Phineas Gage had had a traumatic injury to his prefrontal cortex. Now, luckily for young people, when you turn 11, you don't get a tamping rod shot through your prefrontal cortex, right? Young people are every bit as capable of being thoughtful and courteous and hardworking, but the part of their brain designed to help them manage competing impulses, engage in goal-directed behavior, is under construction just as they hit adolescence. So if you've read any of the research, you might know that the prefrontal cortex is involved in what psychologists and neuroscientists call executive function skills. So executive function skills, but it's the seat, the seat of executive function is in the prefrontal cortex, but there are networks widely distributed throughout the brain. So this orchestra conductor is helping young people manage working memory, so the ability to have a meeting with a supervisor, remember, keep in working memory what's expected of me, and then go implement the plan. Uh, it's the part of my brain that helps me if I'm feeling angry or upset to say, you know what, take 10 deep breaths and go calmly have a conversation with my colleague and my colleague. That's young people's executive suite that is helping them do those very complex tasks. Executive function also is our ability to be nimble and agile in our thinking. So if I've got a work plan, and I've been told to do this, but all of a sudden I hit a roadblock, something unexpected happens, somebody I was supposed to get a paper from didn't send it. Executive function is my capacity to say, oh, you know what, I'm going to pivot and try this. I'm going to problem solve. I'm going to strategize, as opposed to getting so panicked that I don't know how to respond. So as you think about what makes not just a good student worker, but a good colleague, a good manager, a good husband, a good wife, all executive function skills are critical to our success in life. Because otherwise, we are basically a hot mess, a hot reactor, walking around the world spewing our emotional impulses and just sort of going wherever I feel the day wants me to go. So we should thank our executive function skills for a lot. The foundation of executive function is built during early childhood. 
but it continues to grow and develop all the way through the adolescent years, with, with the next major growth spurt happening during adolescence. Whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. And the experiences that young people have during this growth spurt of their brain have a greater impact than at any other time in their lives. So as people who work with adolescents, it's important for us to understand that this executive suite is under construction just as they're entering our companies, just as they're entering the workforce. So, what does this look like when the prefrontal cortex is under construction? It can look different in every single young person. Sometimes due to hardwiring and temperament, due to the experiences that they had during early childhood, due to the experiences that they're having during adolescence. But it does explain some of the potentially misguided sort of kids these days attitude. Because when we see the prefrontal cortex go under construction, and the executive center go through a major growth spurt, this can help explain why a very organized seventh grader or a fifth grader can have a very difficult time organizing their life at 15. This is, can it help explain some of the risk-taking behavior that when you look back and you think about some of the things that you did when you were 16, think how could such a smart kid do such a stupid thing? It has nothing to do with smarts and everything to do with impulse control, right? It has nothing to do with what they know is right or wrong and everything to do with their executive capacities to manage their impulses and engage in a forward-going motion. So this organization, there's one, organi there's one organization in this country that knows this probably better than anyone else and they've never seen the research and never seen the fMRI scans. And that is the automobile insurance industry. Uh, yeah. Why on earth do 16, 17, 18 year olds have higher insurance rates than their adult counterparts? They have better eye hand coordination. They do get hurt, they bounce back quickly. They have excellent, excellent fast reflexes. The automobile insurance industry does not know anything about the science, but they have looked at the statistics. The young people are more likely to engage in risk-taking behavior than their adult counterparts. So I wanted to add a few other things to this list because, of course, what we want to make sure, and we will spend most of the rest of the time sort of counteracting this idea that therefore all young people have, they're just time bombs waiting to go off and their prefrontal cortex has, has nothing to, to offer them. Because what we know, also about this time in our lives is that because this executive suite is developing, this also accounts for the passion, the enthusiasm, the hunger for learning and growth, the incredible innovative ideas that young people can bring to the table. So the teen brain can be a real strength if we understand how, as adults, we can play the most positive role that we can to leverage some of their assets. So any questions so far about, the, about executive skills in general, executive function, or the, the role of the prefrontal cortex. Yeah? This is, this is more of a personal question. If you have 25 and your brain is fully developed, if you look at that whole, the more you do something, the better you get at it. That is the line. So yeah, so the brain continues, yes. The brain is not active. <laughs> Starting at 30, it's a slow development. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, although, there are, we are at our peak in the 30s in terms of some of these executive skills. This is a different presentation, but oftentimes young people say I'm better at multitasking, um, or I have to multi chronically multitask. Well, they can, they're not very good at it, according to every research study we've ever done. Um, but they are a little bit better at it than adults, not because they were born in 1990, but because their executive skills peak around or in their early 20s. And that's why they can have this written, a little bit more mental agility than adults. However, um, our brains are quite plastic. Just because those windows of opportunity close doesn't mean it's not still malleable. And that rule of whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at is true throughout our lives. It's just that you might have to have a few more repetitions <laughs> to have the same impact on the actual wiring of the brain as an adult than during those very plastic, plastic windows. But, there, but this also means that the, it's never too late. So if we say, oh, well, this, this young person didn't get the right experiences in the zero to five window of opportunity, so, well, that's the way their brain is. It's not true. It means it's going to take an incredible network of supportive adults and supervisors to make sure that that young person succeeds. 
but their brain is every bit as capable of rewiring those networks to become successful and be able to regulate their emotions. Yeah. I'm just curious if some of your research really zeroes in on that executive functioning with the research as far as ADHD. Yeah, so a lot of the executive, most of the people who are looking at executive function in this country started in ADHD and ADD research because it is an executive function disorder. They're not the same. Um, and that there's a whole suite of executive functioning challenges that don't fall under the same uh, sort of diagnostic rubric as ADHD, but they're related. So as, as you think about some of the things that I said are related to executive function, you can see how ADD and ADHD fall under that rubric. So those are executive function challenges that young people need to help manage uh, more so than a, um, you know, a, a developing brain that, that does not have those challenges. So, you know, we, what we do is we translated a lot of the research, so we're in touch with people who do that. Um, but what we do is we, we read that research and then help parents understand, supervisors understand those sorts of challenges. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a great question. So I'm gonna just really quickly paint, finish up in two minutes about what's, what's the last bit of the teenage brain, then we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about so what. Um, we've kind of gotten to it a little bit, but this could be another hour that we could spend on hormones, we're not going to. Um, though it would be very fun. Um, but you know, when I was a young person, when I was in health class, this was the story I was told about myself and my body. For adolescence was hormones. Enough said, you'll grow out of it. Um, good luck out there. So um, really, now we're understanding that so much of what we thought was happening during adolescence is a lot about executive function and prefrontal cortex, but especially in relationship to changes in hormones. So let me just quickly um, paint a, a brief picture, but at the end of the day, what we can do in our two minute hormone lesson is I like to think of hormones as the gas pedal and the prefrontal cortex is the brakes in our brain. So the brakes saying stop, look and listen before we do something. The brakes saying, okay, what's the best course of action for me to fulfill this project, to complete this task? Um, the hormones are like, woo! You know, they are gas pedal to flow, they accelerate our emotional reactions and impulses. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about male hormones and female hormones with huge, huge, huge quotes around them. Because of course, as I described what's going on in the male brain, you should all think of uh, female students who act the same way. And these are just population level differences. But I think they're still, they're still useful. Um, testosterone increases by 1,000% during adolescence with an average of seven surges of testosterone every single day. So you're going to your locker, and I'll go, <laughs> testosterone surge. You're hanging out with your friend, testosterone surge. Huge, huge, monumental shifts in the chemical stew running through your body just as young men hit adolescence. Now, maybe you've thought of testosterone as related to aggressive risk taking. From the brain's perspective, it really is just about sort of emotional arousal. It's just that sort of being on the, on the tip. So it doesn't have to be about anger. Except that there's a part of your brain that's designed to welcome in testosterone. It's like, woo, come on in, I got plenty of space. And that is your amygdala, which you may not recognize the term, but it's the fight or flight center of your brain. So as a young man hits adolescence, he's going to his blogger, testosterone surge. The part of his brain lighting up, like the 4th of July, is the fight or flight, anger, hot reactor part of his brain. This is why two young men who are walking towards each other in the hall, I'm sure this doesn't happen at Cristo Rey, right? um, but they knock each other's shoulders, it can turn into a fight before anybody even knows what happens. You talk to the young men afterwards, you say, what's going on? I don't even remember. It was like a white light in front of me, right? Hopefully, two grown men, two teachers here, hit each other's shoulders, and the first thing that cues in is their prefrontal cortex. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. You know what, it's not a big deal. We like each other that much, but we're paying for it, right? <laughs> so, this is part of what helps adults, is that as they have those hot reactor moments, they have a prefrontal cortex that comes in to help them. Unfortunately for young men, their prefrontal cortex sometimes is out to lunch. Um, for young women, there's a different set of chemicals at work. The main one is a neurotransmitter called serotonin. So we've all heard the story, young women hit adolescence and estrogen and progesterone start going up and down as they start their menstrual cycle. That's not, that's old news. What we didn't know was that a neurotransmitter called serotonin starts going like this. 
wild, fluctuating wildly. Serotonin levels, when they're like this, our moods are pretty stable. When they go like this, it's moods that can change on a dime. As confusing to me on the inside as it is to you on the outside. This is why if you ever read that book, you will hear a story where I come down, I open the refrigerator to get milk for my cereal, and tragedy struck. There was no milk. <laughs> my prefrontal cortex was long gone. I melted to the ground sobbing. There's never any milk in this family. I hate this family. I don't have any friends. <laughs> my parents come rushing in, thinking I've stabbed myself in the leg, and I mother something like, I hate you, get out of here, you never buy me any milk. <laughs> now, without understanding what's going on in my brain, it's easy to say bad attitude, she'll draw back away slowly, focus goes away. As confusing to me on the inside as it is to her, and to my parents on the outside. Now that example is a nice, safe example to use in the book. Because I grew up in a household where I had breakfast every day, where nine times out of ten there was milk in the refrigerator. And where the biggest things I was dealing with was how do I deal with my annoying parents who come in and make sure that I'm okay. So imagine living with serotonin that can fluctuate on a dime when you're trying to figure out who am I and who do I want to be? Where's my next meal? Who are the adults that I can trust? How do I navigate my new professional responsibilities in a world that is so different from the one that I have at school or the one that I have at home? Then it becomes much more challenging to regulate those emotions. And you need all that much more support from the caring adults so without going into too much more detail, you can think of the teenage brain from just a purely scientific perspective as sort of a race car with the gas pedal to the floor and the brakes are under construction. Now, there's a couple of poor responses to this as a society, and this is where the research in the teen brain can go horribly awry. You can take a look at this research and say, look, teens are broken, their brains don't work, and we should send them to their rooms until they're 25. Or, you know, oh, it's what I call the lockdown approach. You don't have a prefrontal cortex? I'll be your prefrontal cortex. I will do everything for you. I will map your every move, one wrong step, and you're out of here, right? Because I'm just trying to manage a ticking time bomb, which is not at all what's going on inside the teenage brain. Okay, so that's one way. The other approach is fly away, little bird. You look big. You're acting big. Just go. Here's your project. I'll see you in three months. I hope you succeed, right? If you think you're all so grown up, then you can act just like any, anyone else here at our company. And this is very terrifying when you, are, when you need more coaching. Both of these responses, either I'm going to clamp down and do everything for you, or I'm going to completely back away, ignore the basic lesson of brain science. That the experiences that young people have during the growth spurts of their brain have a greater impact than at any other time in their lives. Neither of those approaches give young people practice in executive skills that they will use for the rest of their lives. It also doesn't honor the real strengths that young people can bring to the table. Executive function is how we work, not what we are capable of. So if we can help people, young people with the how, training them, teaching them, coaching them in those executive skills, then the what can explode and bring great value to your company, to your community, to your school. Because young people have so much to bring to the table. And if we lock down or let them go, we are not only robbing them of important practice, but we are losing out. Because we're reducing them to their prefrontal cortex under construction, which is not at all a good picture. So what, what can it look like? I'm gonna offer a couple of tools and tips, and this is where I wanna hear your questions, your comments, your challenges. So, <clears throat> From the brain's perspective, lock down and let go are not very helpful. What can be very, very helpful in terms of leveraging the strengths of the brain is to really think of yourself as an executive coach. And I don't mean the kind that does uh, executive coaching with the president of 3M. I mean executive function coaching. Because once we see ourselves as not just a supervisor, but an executive function coach, we start to really see young people's capacities expand. So what do I mean by executive function coaching? I think when we do this, we start to see the teen brain as an asset. So we know that young people bring innovative ideas. They bring a hunger for leadership, you know, depending upon the person, very action-oriented. The thing that I love about working with teens is that they'll say, you know, so what? 
So what are we going to do about it? Let's make some changes. Let's try something. Let's think outside the box. Let's bring new ideas to the table. Risk taking does not inherently have to be bad. It is very scary to try something that is just at the edge of your skill set and to push yourself to achieve something that is more than you think you're capable of and stand up in front of a group of colleagues and give a presentation about your work. That is risky. But what an incredibly positive risk for a young person to take. So if we can channel the risk-taking impulses of young people into productive, positive, and healthy risks, I think that we would all be seeing teams a lot different. And too many young people don't have those opportunities to really push themselves in a supported way where they can take those positive risks. Because whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. And the more that we help them practice, the more that they're able to do this on their own. So executive func function coaching, if we think about what is the role of a coach, what's the role of communication in being a good executive function coach, and then we're gonna end with a little bit on how important connection is to unleash the power of the cortex and unleash the power of the executive function. Before we dive into these three things in our last 25 minutes together, any questions so far just about what's going on in the brain, hormones, executive centers? Is this, does this stuff make sense? Is it, is it helpful if you think about what's going on? I think what can be helpful is it takes it out of he's got a bad attitude. This kid's got a chip on his shoulder. And this is also why young adolescent girls are at a much higher risk of depression, because they already have a lot of challenges around serotonin regulation. Um, this is why we also have to be very clear, and I'm glad you brought this up, is that sometimes people will take a look at the teenage brain and then they see moody young women, and they think, ah, oh, she'll know all of them. It's just her serotonin levels like this. It is normally abnormal to have mood swings during adolescence. It's not normal to not want to get out of bed to not want to talk to your supervisor, to not want to come to school, to, to chronically underperform and not look at you in the eye. Those sorts of things are red flags that something, we're staying low for too long. Um, and that's where we need to make sure that we don't just, you know, for so many young people say, oh, she'll grow out of it, right? Sometimes when we start to see red flags, changes in eating, changes in sleeping, that's where you have to work with a team of, if you're starting to see those things in the workplace, chronically, like, chronically doing these things that it might be a symptom of some underlying um, depression, which then you get a team, increased array has got all sorts of great resources for helping students. Um, so that's, it's, I'm glad you brought it up because what we don't want to do is say, you know, all of these challenges are not sure. But yeah, so young, and this is also why we want to make sure we're helping young women talk towards solutions because also what young, what young people can do is that when they're feeling low, they call their friends and then they start to feel lower. Um, they feel good for a second, but all of a sudden what, what was a little challenge becomes, it feels insurmountable. Um, and so making sure to validate young people's emotions, it sounds like you're really frustrated. It sounds like you're really feeling embarrassed that you missed the bus yesterday and didn't get to work on time. Is that, you know, talk to me about how you can validate, and then let's talk about strategies. What can we do to, to make it different next time? Right, so going towards proactive strategies that are sort of more self-help, so that we reduce that I'm talking to myself deeper and deeper. Um, any other questions about the science? Great. So executive function coaching, part of what we want to do is we don't want to be young people's prefrontal cortex. Uh, we also don't want to just say, you know, the fly away little bird approach. It's about loosening <coughs> but not letting go. And so our role is to act as a, as a surrogate prefrontal cortex, a coach, to give them the practice that they need, which is especially important in the beginning of their, your relationship with a youth worker, 
um, and then a student worker, and then you know you loosen as they get better, just like a coach would. So you wouldn't say, oh, you've never played basketball before? Well, here it is, and we're going to put you in the starting lineup, and good luck out there. Um, you also wouldn't say, for 10 months, we're going to just sit and we're just going to do like this, right? So just like coaching, figuring out where were the strengths, where can they go, how can we use their strengths and help scaffold or coach their experience so that they get, as they gain comfort and as they gain competency, they practice more and more and more. So for me, the metaphor of a coach is helpful um, because I can picture myself working with a group, you know, a team, and thinking about skill building, and we don't have to think about that in terms of work. Um, so one of the major executive skills that young people are practicing are what we call goal management skills. Goal management skills is, here's what I want to do. I'm going to walk back from that goal to the nine steps it's going to take for me to get there, and I have to figure out what I need to do in the next hour, in the next day, in the next three weeks to get to that goal. That is more complicated than you think it is, and requires incredible orchestration up here. Um, especially because the world does not work always how we think it's going to work when we set those goals. There's always things that come up that you weren't anticipating. Remember, that's that cognitive agility that's core to executive function. So thinking about, and I'll give you a couple tips around goal management skills, but really thinking about how do you help them. A lot of it is about breaking big goals down into achievable steps and helping them do that. So as opposed to mapping out, here's what we want at the end of this semester. It's how do we work backwards from that? What is that going to look like today? What is that going to look like this week? And as you see them start rolling and start doing it themselves, all right, then we can loosen up a little bit. But start by over-coaching and really thinking about what are those things that you need. So achievable steps. Um, checking in more frequently than you think you might need to with planning and adjustments and making some systems around that. Um, so how are things going? You know, we set this goal. Do we need to make any adjustments? Involving them in that process. What do you think? How could you adjust? What are some potential challenges you might see? At the same time that we want to work on goal management and we want to help, we also don't want to overdo it. So we want to support their efforts, but we won't want to do it for them. Um, we want to encourage them, but not you know, swoop in. Because every time that we swoop in and we say, oh, you know what, don't worry about it, I'll do it for you, then we're robbing them of practice, right? Which is what their brain needs. So starting very structured loose. Now this important to being a good coach is communication. And so if we don't communicate, it can be very difficult for them to practice. So don't wait for students to come to you with a problem. This is common practice with adults, right? Here's your thing, and if I don't hear from you, I'm gonna assume things are going great. If you don't hear from a student, things might be going, they might be going better than you imagined. They also might not be going anywhere at all. Not for bad attitude, but sometimes because I don't know what to do, and I don't have the skills, I don't, I have never known that it was safe to go up to an adult and ask for help. Um, whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. If I haven't learned that adults are safe, and that I can go to them with questions, um, especially in an employee, employer context, that might be way up here in terms of skill set. So checking in very frequently with the beginning. Um, avoiding generalizations and focusing on behavior in terms of communication. So one of your roles as a prefrontal cortex coach is to hold up a mirror to students about their strengths and things that they can work on. And so when we say things like, oh, you're always so helpful. At what? <laughs> at, at the thing that, I, that you know, I did that I actually don't think is that great or at this other thing. So being very specific, you know, the way that you persisted in this task and re you know, reached out and made sure that you came and asked me about this thing, you know, I, that was a very, effective strategy. So, okay, now I know that that's really helpful, I'm gonna do that again, as opposed to just blanket, oh, you, you're so great, you're so wonderful. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling you people they're wonderful, but it doesn't give them a lot of guidance in terms of coaching. So being very specific, um, and then I wanna talk about a little bit about, in terms of praise, uh, the growth mindset. So let's talk a little bit about goal management, growth mindset, and then we'll wrap up. Goal management, there's been a lot of work around this in terms of youth development, but I sometimes find it helpful to think of it in terms of this GPS model that Dr. Werner has developed. And this is just something that I take through in my head as I work with students sometimes, which is they helping them, part of the executive suite are these three things. Where do I want to go? 
how do I get there, and what do I do when the road gets rough, okay? So if you can think through your meetings with students in terms of these three things, you are doing them a great service in terms of helping them practice, but also you're much likely to get uh, better performance. And this is true for adults too, by the way. Um, so, you know, where do I want to go? Shrink the change is how do I break it into achievable steps, right? So I want to go here, what's the little step I can take? Pursuit of strategies, what's the best way to get there? Having students generate those themselves. Again, whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. And then as a supervisor, you can highlight the bright spots. Oh, that's a great strategy. I have seen that work very well for you. Let's try that one again. So highlight where you feel like they're the strongest and be specific with that phrase. And then what do I do when the road gets rough? It's very helpful to start asking students to anticipate challenges. Because if we just address it as they happen, that's going to happen inevitably. But a great question can be, what are some potential challenges that might arise? What's your greatest fear about this project? OK, so you're terrified to talk on the phone. Great. Let's practice this. Let's do it. Whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. What is your, your greatest fear is not getting there on time. All right. How, what do we need to do at home to make sure that that alarm goes or that your friend calls you? So it's all about anticipating challenges. This is a huge executive function skill. Right? As opposed to just, oh, this happened, I didn't know what to do, so I didn't show up for three days. Okay? Anticipating <laughs> challenges. Um, you know, this is the road that we would think we would take, just a straight line, right? They come into the world, we're feeding them, we're swaddling them, and then all of a sudden they're adults, but really it looks a lot more like this. <laughs> this is true for all of us. When we start a new job, whether we are 35 or whether you are 14. And so coaching, this is what I, I'm going to end with this idea of the growth mindset and connection. Because this is a thing that you can change right away that I think can be helpful in terms of fostering a culture of growth. And what I mean is, this is the expectation. We should not expect young people, or new colleagues for that matter, to just blow us out of the water every time. Just exemplars of perfection. It's not realistic, and if you see that happening, it's probably because there's a lot of hiding of mistakes, of fears, of unknowns. And so part of what we want to do is make sure that we're nurturing what we call a growth mindset in adolescence. Our growth mindset is this idea that any skill can be learned, that our brains are a work in progress, whether you are 15 or whether you are 65, and that through practice, effort, and persistence, you too can be excellent at what you do. This is totally different from a fixed mindset which is that I'm born into the world, either smart or dumb, good at this or bad at this. Oh, I, I, I want to do this project because I'm really good at this. I'm, I'm horrible at that. Or I'm not smart enough to be in the communications department. I'm not smart enough to do this, right? This is this, is this idea that we are born hardwired to be good at some things and bad at others. When we have a fixed mindset, we tend to guard perfection with our lives. Because if I show that I'm not good at something, then I'm stupid, right? If I believe that I can't learn to be better at something, then I better darn well be good at things that I've been told to do. Either I'm gonna quit it or say I can't do it, or if I try it, I'm gonna not let you into my mistakes, vulnerabilities, and fears. So let me give you an example of this, because this is something you can do with your students the moment you leave here. So Carol directed all this research, and what she did is she broke students into two groups. And she came and she gave you all the easy puzzles. They were right at your competency level. They weren't too easy, but they were your sweet spot and you did great. You all did, you all got A pluses. And then she came to you, and the only thing different between these two groups of students, controlling for a number of different variables, she came to you and she said, oh, you're so smart at puzzles. Oh, you're really good at this. And then she came over to you and she said, oh, you must have worked really hard on those puzzles. Good job, I'm really proud of you. Then she came back the next day and she gave him a choice. You can do the easy set of puzzles from yesterday, or you can challenge yourself, and I've got a harder set. Over 90% of the students who are told that they are smart chose the easier problem set. Over 85% of the students who are told that they worked hard chose the more challenging problem set. This makes a ton of sense from the standpoint of how a student feels when they're praised. If I tell you, I am so proud of you because you're so smart at this, what on earth is going to happen if I fail? What is she going to think of me? Is she going to be proud of me? Am I still going to be a valued employee? Now you all, you're in total control. You're in the driver's seat. 
because you can always work hard at the task that I give you. So I give you a harder one, great. I can work just, I'll work even harder. And you're confident that you're gonna get my approval. And so that's a classic example of how we can nurture a growth mindset. So you all, what I was doing as I, as I praised your effort and your persistence was I was saying you can get better, your effort matters, and you can, this skill can be developed. I'm telling you, well, you're either good, you're great at it, but it's pretty fixed. It's a natural or innate ability. So we can nurture a growth mindset in students by praising their effort, persistence, and how they strategize and problem solve over their natural talents. It can be very tempting to say, oh, you're, you're so smart. You're the smartest student worker we've ever had. There's nothing, it's something we don't want to praise students, but being specific about effort and persistence is going to go a lot farther in terms of making sure that you create a culture of openness around mistakes. Because what you don't want to do is have a student so scared to share that they messed up or they think they did something wrong that they don't come to you and talk about it. A growth mindset would say, let's talk about these mistakes because this is where we learn. By the way, this is not just research about adolescents. This is We've looked at you know, Fortune 500 companies across the country. Corporations that have a growth mindset do far better because it's a culture of learning and growth. Um, so encourage self-assessment. So instead of saying, oh, I'm sure it was fine, it's gonna be great, and then changing everything before you submit it to the team, well, how do you think it went? What are you most proud of about this? What, what do you think was shaping? How could we strategize to make it even better next time? Expect and celebrate mistakes and then model this. You know, I, was, I really didn't know what to do here either, so I went and asked so-and-so. Or I worked, I had to work really hard, I didn't know what I was doing at first, but man, after a year of really hard work, I feel like I'm really contributing. So that you are not this pedestal, I just came in naturally gifted in, in this field. Not that you don't have gifts. So, and then finally, if we do coaching, high expectations, if we nurture a growth mindset, and then we, we have the core ingredient that makes any of this possible is connection. Because when we don't feel connected, our bodies feel stressed. When we feel stressed, our brains shut down from the top down. By the top, I mean our executive center, down into our emotional reactive brain. And if I'm shut down from the top down, then all of this fancy dancy goal management and strategic, this I'm not even close to a cortex that can engage in that type of thinking. If I'm walking along a, a path and all of a sudden I hear something jump out in the woods, my brain immediately goes down into my limbic brain, into my emotional center, because I'm in fight or flight, survival mode. Thinking abstractly about my goals is a frivolous activity when I feel like I'm under threat. It's very stressful for students not to feel connected in your company or in your organization. For nobody to know their name, to know what they're up to. So connection, without connection, all this other stuff is sort of fluff. This is why Dr. Peter Benson, uh, late Dr. Peter Benson of Search Institute, wanted to start a national campaign called No Child Left on No. Not just because it feels good, but because it's critical to success. So this is why Chris stands out every day and other staff here and shakes the students' hands as they come in. That is not just because it looks pretty on the annual report. It's because it boosts the performance of the cortex. Because when I feel connected, I feel safe, and then I can unleash my executive center. So there's all kinds of ways you can do that that we're not gonna be able to go deeply into, but names, learn what they're into, incorporate them into, into corporate culture, don't assume that they feel comfortable, find little ways to do that connected, working with a connected platform. So I can send you more handouts on some of the specific strategies, but I think from the perspective of the prefrontal cortex, if we can see ourselves as their coach, if we can nurture that growth mindset, make sure that we all see ourselves as a work in progress, that we have high expectations and accountability, but that we do that in a way that's about a culture of learning, and that if we make sure that students feel safe and secure, I think that's when we see the team brain blow us out of the water. And they bring so much more to the table than we would have ever imagined in the first place. So hopefully this was a helpful quick tour of what's going on inside the team brain. I know that we need to be out of here at nine, uh, so we have a couple minutes for questions, comments, especially around some of these strategies. Does this make sense? What do you do in your organizations, in your corporations? Uh, what have you found that works? What we can do open questions. If nobody has open questions, I have a couple things you can talk about as well. Yeah. This just reminds me, like my girls are grown now, but their whole lives I see my dad in them. Mm -hmm. And my dad died when I was 20, 20. And I always thought, I wish I wish I knew him as an adult so that I could say, see dad, I did listen. See yeah. dad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I've seen that. So his gift.
sometimes working with really anybody, but with student workers as they're growing and learning, you can get instant gratification, right? Your kids going great, they light you up, you're just, you're in sync, you're rolling. Sometimes it's a delayed gratification activity. And so you don't see the benefit. You do the hard conversation, you do the coaching, and you're working and you're working. What's the, oh, what's the point in this, right? The amazing, it's not, the feedback loops sometimes are years, a decade away um, for some students. So sometimes you're gonna get performance right off the bat. But the last thing we wanna do is completely let go. If we need extra support from Cristo Ray to serve that student, if we need some extra resources to figure out how can I make sure that I'm getting the support I need to engage. But whatever the brain does a lot of is what the brain gets good at. And it's not one repetition. If it were one repetition, we could put kids in a year of remedial growing up school and teach them all of life's lessons and then send them out into the world. It's 